go on over. Matter of fact, you can go on over real quick. You go to uh, John. I'll show you in John real quick. I want to look at this in John. Let's look at this. And then I'm going to go back to uh, what I had to share. John 12. John 12. Look at John 12 real quick. I just want you to see this part. John 12. Verse 23, Jesus answered saying, the hour has come and the son of man should be honored. See, truly I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth more fruit. I remember used to, people used to talk about in those, when it first came to Jesus, you got to die to self. You got to die to self. You don't hear that message anymore, do you? You, you want to hear, you got to live to self. <laughs> That's what, that's the message now. They die to self. What does it mean to die to self? You're crucified with Christ. That's your inward man, right? Your old sin nature was nailed to the cross. But now you have to nail the outward man who still has his little views, his little attitudes, his little perspectives. You've got to bring him under subjection. You've got to crucify him daily. Okay, that's taking up your cross. That's what Jesus said, unless a piece of corn fall on the ground and die. And see, without this message right here, you won't walk in real power. You'll walk in mysticism. You'll walk in, you know, just a, a mental ascent. Because your life has to reflect that which is of his. As he is, so are you in the world. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. Right. And I'm going to show you some different things that go on that. So he says. If it, if it'll abide alone, but if it dies, it'll bring forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. He that hates his life. In this world. Now, here's what I want to tell you. He that lightly esteems. He that. Uh, lightly values. He, what does it mean to despise? It means to lightly esteem, to despise his life in this world, meaning the earthly walk. Why? Because the earth is corrupt. The earth is corrupt. It's contaminated. So the reality is, he says, he that hates his life in this world, meaning he, you don't attach yourself. You lightly esteem it. He will keep it under eternal life. If any man will serve me, let him follow me that where I am, it, uh, he may be all, uh, that where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, my father will honor. Now, um, what he says is, what shall a man gain or profit if he gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? He's not talking about just his spirit. He's talking about his mind, his emotions, he becomes a slave to the world. The Bible tells and encourages you to come out from among the mentality. It doesn't mean you can't talk to people and be joyous and happy. And it, it, what it means, you need to come out from their mindset, man. Stop trying to adapt to society. Stop compromising and accommodating. It doesn't mean you run around and condemn people. That's not your job. Your job is to bring them to Jesus, right? Your job is to be a lifestyle, but don't adapt yourself to their system. This is a mentality that many Christians have taken on. They try to fit in. Do you understand? Don't fit into a broke system, friend. Do not fit into a broke system. It's a corrupt system. Adapt yourself. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be changed. Be metamorphosed. Renew your mind until the life of Jesus in you begins to consume your thoughts, your words, your actions. Come on, your behavior. You understand? Till it consumes you to where Christ lives through you now in the world. Christ lives through you. You find yourself saying things and you're like, that's not me. Amen. Now, go on over to 1 Peter now because I want to read this. 1 Peter, I'm going to... Talk about joy a little bit. Actually, go to uh, Philippians and First Peter. 
This is this was my message here this morning. Thought there was going to be one or two other people, but I'm going to share it anyway. And John 16, 1 Peter 5, Philippians 3. We'll get to some other places. Amen. And what you and I want to cultivate. There you go. Let's start first in Philippians 3. Why don't we? For the rest, my brethren, delight yourselves in the Lord. Delight yourselves in the Lord. What is, and, and of course, you know that scripture in Psalm 3 says, delight yourselves in the Lord to give you the desires of your heart. But he says, delight yourself in the Lord. And continue to rejoice that you're in him. Amen. That's it. Not when your new house comes, your car, your this, your that. Come on, nothing wrong with those things. Be happy, but rejoice and be so full because you know him. Because there's somebody who loves you if nobody else does. There's somebody that has vowed themselves, that has tied themselves to you irrevocably. Through his precious blood. Come on now. I don't want to start preaching. Really, If you were really hearing this. You'd become unglued. And that's the problem I got. With, with a lot of believers. They're not happy because they're in Christ. They're happy for everything else. Three little music bands. And a, and a hallelujah. And then they get a goosebump. And want to run. Look if you can't wake up in the morning. And be thrilled and jazzed. And on fire because you're in him you missed the boat you missed the boat friend you missed the whole boat and you're looking for something else a hug a pat on the back a goose bump a better job a better this a better that your faith is conditional your faith is conditional it ain't based on the reality of what he did for you and if, if this message is boring it's because you're boring you're boring. Your faith is boring. I hate to say it. I don't know why I'm saying these things, Lord. Holy Spirit. Your faith is boring. I'm tired of being around boring Christians. They bore me, man. I want to see some faith. Happy I'm in Christ. Happy I'm a new creation. You actually wake up every day boldly in the face of your challenges, your adversity, and your problem. You say, that the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice. I choose to be glad in it. I choose to exercise dominion over my mind, my emotions, and these little phony, feeble, fake problems that the enemy's trying to stream towards you. And just like R.W. Shambach said, you don't have any problems. <laughs> you don't. You got no problems today. If you think you got a problem, you don't. You're deceived. You're in somewhere between faith and unbelief. You ain't got no problems. And you say, well, yeah, but you know, I'm a person of faith and I've been in church for like 10 years. Doesn't matter. You're somewhere between unbelief and faith. You don't got no problems. You ain't got no problems. You think, yes, I do. You don't know that PG&E bill is coming. So what? Shut it off. Light a candle. Have fun. I'll tell you what a problem is. The problem is when you're laying up in the ICU with a tube stuck down your throat and they've given you a bill of, uh, you know, that's a problem. Okay. So you ain't got no real problems. Well, you don't understand my kids. I know. I do understand your children. But that's their problem, not yours. If you loved them, I'll tell you, if you loved them, you'd turn them over to the Lord. You'd stop trying to play God. Did I say that? You stop trying to be God and get your joy back. You'd be praying all the time. See, but the reality is, uh, you know, we don't have any problems. We just think we got some problems. They're, they're afflictions, but they're nothing. And 2 Corinthians tells you here. Let's look at 2 Corinthians real quick. Then we'll get back to that. Amen. I want to preach, but, you know, because Sundays is a preaching time. Amen. There's a difference. Matter of fact, 
I love this because I heard Brother Copeland say this this week. He actually gave the story that I gave on Tuesday about the demoniac. It talked about preaching. So yesterday, go look it up. He said, Jesus lifted up his horse. Hallelujah. You know, he's old school. And preached. See, all these people teaching, teaching. They got enough teaching to last a lifetime. So many Christians have so many teachings, so many books, and they still ain't doing the first thing, going to prayer and reading the word on a regular basis. Be a doer, not a hearer. And then you got people so far out in left field now, and they're talking about this and that, and revelations and all this. Man, you got to get back to doing the basics, friend. Get back to your first love. Nothing wrong with all those things. They're there. There's so much information out there. And everybody thinks, look, the word of God will direct you. Uh, where did I tell you to go? Second Corinthians, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse, we're starting reading verse 17. Look, you ain't got no problems. 2 Corinthians 4. You're just living between your ears. Our light momentary, everybody say momentary. Affliction, this slight distress of a passing hour is more and more abundantly preparing and producing. Someone says, you don't understand my feelings and how I, that's your whole problem. You're governed by how you feel. Feel, 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 feel. Once you get into the spirit, those feelings will dwindle away, right? And here's the truth. Nobody needs to know how you feel. Nobody needs to know. God. There's a time in our lives where we always want somebody to understand us. You got to leave that boat. It's not important what other people understand about you. It's what's important is that Jesus understands. Amen. We have not a high priest who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Amen. He understands, but many times that's not good enough for us. We need somebody naturally to understand. You know, and the reality is, is no one's ever going to understand. Or if they do, you know, why is it we get so comfortable when someone says, I understand. And then we feel better. <laughs> why is that? It's fleshy, isn't it? I mean, we've all done it. We go through a trial, a challenge, some problem, and, and we start sharing our problem. And someone else says, I understand. And, and then we go, I feel better now because they understand. <laughs> And when you look at it, it's foolishness because the only, they, the only person that really needs that you need to know understands you is Jesus. And that's what Hebrews says. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But do you know why we find comfort? I'm just sharing in other people understanding. You want to know why? Because what they do is they, when, when someone else understands your problem, it gives you a, 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 a passiveness. I mean, a uh, what's the word I'm, a word I'm looking for? Uh, it's an affirmation, but it, it's it's a it's a uh, like just a it's just an emotional validation. That's it. That keeps you in a passive, neutralized condition. Still, just listen. It keeps you in a passive, neutralized condition. Still. But when you understand Jesus is touched with feelings of your firm and teeth, and then it says, but was in all points tempted like as you are. See, now, see, he understands, but then he directs you how to get out of that mentality, mindset, and that discombobulated situation you're in. He says, I understand. I've been there. And you go, that's good. That's good. I've been there. And he understands me. But then he says, I was tempted, challenged, tried, but I overcame. And I'm going to show you how to overcome. And that's at the point where most Christians go, I just wanted the first part. I wanted you to be empathetic, compassionate, emotionally connected with me. Now, hold on. Don't start preaching at me. <laughs> See, that's how they are. As soon as you give them the way out, they go, don't start preaching. I wanted you to validate. I wanted you to to just agree with, in a sense, my misery. <laughs> but I don't want you to help me to get free. <laughs> Come on now. 
about our whole lives looking for someone to just comfort our emotions. Look, man. Look what Paul says. His mentality was, look, this is what Paul's mentality was. This light afflictions just for a moment. It's actually working for me a far more exceeding eternal way to glory. While I don't look to the things that are seen, but to the unseen, for the things that are seen are temporal, the unseen things are eternal. I'd like to find those kind of Christians. When they go through a challenge, they go, Brother Dave, don't worry, man. This is just a light affliction. I'm an overcomer. Actually, you want me to tell you something? This challenge and test that Satan has thrown at me, it's actually just helping me. It's actually just preparing me. Can you imagine that? The devil thought he was going to destroy me, but actually God's using it as a tool to help me to grow in faith and to become more, more, more powerful, more anointed, more gracious, more loving. How many Christians do you find saying that? Not many, but it's right here. I mean, look at, look at the Apostle Paul. He says, it's a light of faith. It's actually producing and achieving an everlasting way to glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and calculations. It is a blessedness never to cease. So I don't look at the things that are seen. I mean, if you could just get that out of some Christian's mouth, it'd be wonderful. They could just go, I'm not looking to the seen realm. I'm looking to the unseen, Brother Dave. I mean, if you could just get that out of their mouths, boy, that'd be a lot of progress. If they could just get their eyes off what they see, get their ears off what they're hearing, get their flesh off what they're feeling, and just simply say, I don't even consider the things that are seen. I'm looking to the unseen. I'm looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. I'm setting my mind on things above, not on things on the earth. If you just get some believers to say that, boy, man, we would have like a world that was already halfway in revival. So look what he says. Since we don't look to the things that are seen, but to the unseen, for the things that are visible, they're temporal. The things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. That's why I told you here, I'm going to use it. While the whole world is still trying to digest COVID, <laughs> they are. They're trying to digest it. Those that understand faith are like onward. But we, you don't understand, brother. This is a pandemic. You, you're insensitive. You don't. Because they're natural. They're geared toward the earth. Oh, man. The man or woman of God recognizes the Newsflash. When COVID-19 is over, guess what will come? COVID-20. When COVID-20, they figure that out, COVID-21 will come. And the rest of the baloney the devil hurls. I mean, it was a Spanish flu. It was a bubonic plague. It was a SARS. It was a this. It was a that. Something else will come down the pipeline at some point. Please be aware of that. Please be aware. And treat it the same as you do now. I mean, it, it's unfortunate because we're part of what goes on in society. So we're impacted like the rest of society. The whole economy is shut down. So that's the challenge you and I have is to become intolerant. You know, it's like some days you just get out and, you know, just like, man, go away. <laughs> go away. But it doesn't work like that because you and I aren't in control of the planet. Like, you just want to just wipe your hand and say, go away to COVID. Like, go away. But it, sorry. You know, and I mean that because you're at the gym and you're like got a mask on. You're <laughs> breathing in your mask. And you're like, man, this is hard, man. I mean, it's hard to exercise intensely. You know what I mean? To be in, if you're just like. You got your mask on it, then you're, but if you're like really trying to grind it out and get your sweat going, it's really hard to breathe, man. So I, I have to pull mine down and get fresh air or whatever and, and so forth, so on. But I mean, you just want it to all go away at some point. But so you can become intolerant. But to me, it's just a, it's, it's a light affliction. For me, it's a huge affliction for the world. You understand? There was all kinds of things in Jesus's day too. Do you know that? I want to tell you this. There was lots of diseases. 
lots of viruses, lots of afflictions, lots of different things going on in his day. Do you, do you realize that? Even more than today. He never stopped to acknowledge him. You, if you could really get the mind of Jesus, he never stopped. To acknowledge him. Never stopped and went, let me, let me, let me acknowledge the potency and the power this is on society and has played on humanity. Let, let me, let me give honor to it. Let me validate it. Let me recognize. Jesus never did. That's it. Come out. Who are you? Legion, bye. Leper, go. Clean, free. I mean, Jesus had a purpose, man. That's it. He had one purpose, to be crucified, to restore humanity back into a place of dominion. Okay? So he says, light afflictions for a moment. I I'm going to read you this a couple more, and then we're going to John 16. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, look what the Apostle Paul says. Apostle Paul says, we are hedged and pressed on every side. I'm troubled, oppressed. I ain't cramped. Hmm? I'm not cramped. I'm not crushed. But I suffer embarrassments. I'm not perplexed, unable to uh, uh, unable to find a way out, but not driven to despair. That means in my natural thinking, I'm not going to be able to get an antidote, a solution, and a remedy for this problem. That's what he says. I'm unable to find an antidote. There is no antidote. I don't care how many shots, how many uh, lessons they give, how much education goes out, how, how, how many apparatuses they tell you, there's only one antidote. That is the blood of the cross appropriated in your life. That is it. That is the antidote. Jesus is the true physician. And as Christians, that is our only antidote. Do you understand that? Our only, I'm not saying, you know, whatever, have faith in that. That's what, see, uh, um, hold on a second. You sidetracking me, bro? Hold on. Um, Jesus. Everything else will continue. You and I are to look unto Him and keep gazing, keep gazing, keep gazing. Just like Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you gaze on Jesus. You continue to behold Him, and you're transformed from glory to glory, to glory, from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from love to love, so that what happens is that which is in you grows, and it just becomes, look, if you ever looked in a Petri dish, they put little, like, bacterias and germs, and then they put other things, like treatments, and this is how they do things in labs, and they find, you know, how things work, and they look, and they can see that certain things attack, you understand? That, listen, that's how the life of Jesus is in you. You understand? It's like a fly on those little blue things going, Bzz. that's, no, serious. That's how your spirit is if it's built up. A strong spirit shall sustain a man. A strong spirit. There'll be no attachment. See, don't give place to your thought life, right? A strong spirit. That's why you pray in tongues. Build yourself up. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep your, be fervent. So if there's fire in there, there ain't nothing going to stick. It emanates through every cell of your being. How many of you understand that? It emanates. It comes through. You have life in there, man. Romans 8, 11. Quickens your mortal body. But you have to cultivate, give more room to that truth. Get out of living up here between your ears. So what he says right here, he says, we are persuaded, not deserted, to stand alone. Struck down to the ground, never struck out. Now go to John 16. See, this is no good if we just take Jesus and we don't believe what he said. We just mentally, what's the word? Uh, I'm looking, hold on, hold on. What's the word? We mentally pet it. Massage it is the word. You know what I mean? It didn't take its face value, man. John 16. 
look what Jesus says right here. I'll get you in a minute. John 16 in verse 33. I've told you these things that in me you'd have perfect peace and confidence. See, in the world, you're going to have tribulation, trials, distresses, frustrations, but be of good cheer. That's what I have to talk about. Be of good cheer. Come on now, cheer up. And I'll tell you this. We only been going for maybe an hour and a half. Brother Copeland yesterday, the service was already going for two hours. Then he walked up to the pulpit and gave his message. It's a three hour or more service. <laughs> and I thought, my God, I wonder if those people are sitting there and they're engaged or they've checked out. I mean, because the devil will fight you in this. Because your mind will tell you, well, I know that. And I've heard that. And I did. No. Mm -mm. That's what everybody thought when COVID came how powerful they were and how much anointing and, and uh, they walked in and then all of a sudden churches shut down. Mm -hmm. But those old timers like John G. Lake, when bubonic plague hit, said, put it in my hand. How many Christians can I find today that would say, man, put that COVID right there. Put it right there. Go ahead, spit in there. Watch it die. How many Christians can I find like what, walking in that kind of dominion? Well, all of us should be walking in that kind of dominion. All of us. The choice is a decision, isn't it? You know? There's always an easier way, though, isn't there? Depend on the flesh, depend on man, depend on science, depend on... God wants you to depend on him first. You know? When Jesus called and said, go to the other side, they thought, well, the forecast today looks good. There's, and, and then you know what it said? A horrible tempest arose. They thought the forecast is great. We'll cruise to the other side in the boat and all will be fine and dandy and hunky dory. But on the way, a, a horrendous, look up the word, tempest arose. And it challenged them where they were. They thought, we've been around Jesus. We know the power of God. But as soon as that horrific of a category hurricane tempest arose, they ran to the back and said, <laughs> don't you care for us anymore? Tempest exposed, stripped the veneer of their religiosity and exposed them to the reality of where they were in faith, to where Jesus said, oh, you have little faith, or what did you do with your faith? You're disturbing my sleep. It's not something you want to hear, is it? When you're like pulling out of, <laughs> you know, Jesus, I, 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 my bills and, and this and the, the COVID and the, 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 that, and the, 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 don't you care? If it was the Jesus of today, the Jesus of today and the sensual Jesus that most of the Christians know would wake, would tell them and go, it's all right. I have you covered. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Don't worry. But, but is that the Jesus that was dealing with the apostles? No. No. So why do people believe that Jesus? Well, it's simple. It's called, it's, it's called a fiction. It's a figment of their imagination. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, look what Jesus says. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I'm going to show you. Be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. I've overcome. I've deprived it of its power and have conquered it for you. So what he wants you to do is rejoice. He wants you to actually be happy. He, and we're not going to have a laughing session, but leaving here, you should know, man, I better get my joy in check because it is a very important component and aspect. Go over to James. And it's not good enough just that you and I can go count it all joy, brother, when you face trials of many kinds. It's not good enough to just know it in your head. It's something that you and I got to do when the enemy shows up. You've got to know how to yield, default, defer into the joy, to stir it up, to activate it, to cultivate it. You got to know at that point, go, sorry, Satan. I'm not going to let you get my mind. I'm not going to let you quarantine me in my thought life. Matter of fact, I'll just do a few 
ha 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 ha's right now. You might have to sit there and ha ha your way into victory. There was a lady that used to come to this church and she come, she loved the communion table and she'd come up for prayer. She was like of a depressant type of spirit on her. You know what I mean? Not spirit, but emotionally, just constantly always under the weather, kind of soaking, gloomy. And I go up, every time I go up and lay hands on her, I go, the spirit of God just well up at me and say, rejoice. And I go, ha, 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 ha. And I just said, just, just yield, act on it. And she never yielded. Eventually she left the church because see, she just contemplated in her mind. She always reasoned away the direction of the Holy Spirit. And she probably went to another church and, you know, and she's never going to overcome until she gets what, see, God's answer to your problem ain't what you think. It's what he directs you in. And most people think the answer is them just, you know, doing something else. And a lot of times the answer is just sitting back going, ha, 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 the Lord is on my side. Why did he tell you in James? Count it all joy. That's a really interesting antidote for someone that's under a lot of stress, a lot of contention, a lot of affliction, and a lot of problems. That is not normal. I mean, if, if you're going through massive adversity and I just go like this, you go, bro, count it all joy. Lighten up, man. Start rejoicing. That's going to be honest with you. That's going to tee off a lot of Christians. They're going to get mad because you know what they want you to do? They want you to come alongside and say, I'm sorry this happened, brother. They want you to get in that pool of self-pity with them and say, man, brother, let's just pray. It'll be all right. You know, you're going to make it, man. You know, they don't want you to walk them and say, brother, you know what the Lord said in James? And you go, yeah, that, yeah I don't want to hear that verse. <laughs> I want God to come down with thunder and angels and I need to see a big show. And he says, nah, bro. The Lord says, count it all joy, my brother, when you face trials of many kind. Knowing the testament of your faith develops patient, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be what? Complete. But, but, but what does complete mean? Mature. So previous to that test, you were probably not mature. When you're mature, you realize you ain't lacking. When you're mature, you realize God is my all in all. He's the great. When you're immature, you look at the earth and you see the lack, you see the storm, you feel the problems. When you, when the Lord helps you to move into maturity, you're no longer looking at the whims and whams, the ups and downs. You stay steady, don't you? Abounding and going forward, no matter what's going on in your life. Amen? All right. Let's finish with this verse. Well, we're, we're going to look at uh, First Peter, but First, I want to finish reading uh, Philippians. Come on now. Amen. This is why he says right here. He says, uh, Philippians uh, 3, he says, For the rest, my brethren, delight yourselves in the Lord. Continue to rejoice that you're in Christ. For me to keep writing these things over and over to you. So that means that he had to keep telling them. It wasn't irksome, but it was for their safety. Woo! It's for their safety. He didn't say, he said, you want to stay safe? Here, here. Let me tell you how to stay safe in COVID. Let me tell you how to stay from bubonic plague. Let me tell you how to stay safe when all the world is crumbled, fading away, and faltering. You just sit back and he says, I'm going to tell you how to stay safe. Hallelujah. Shike. <laughs> Glory to God. You, you'll stay safe. Let him shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. And say, the Lord be mag. That's what he said. I can't take you today because you don't have the time to go to Proverbs. I mean, to go to Psalms. In all the times where, where, where King David said, I'll rejoice. I'll rejoice at your word more than he rejoiced when he got rubies and diamonds and gold. It's good to quote in church, but it's better when you're by yourself and you got to do it. So that's an antidote. A merry heart does good like a medicine. So how many Christians are just walking around going, woo-wee, ha, 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 J, 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 Thank you, Father. Boy, the Spirit him raised Jesus from the dead. I got a merry heart, man. Ain't no COVID coming my way. COVID can't touch me. I'm COVID-free. I'm walking in the light of redemption. Glory to God. How many Christians are doing that? Now, they're probably doing it now, a year and a half later, or a year, what is it, a year and a month later. But 
Should they have done this when it first came out? Absolutely. They should have. They should have just been right at the doorstep. Say, he ain't coming up in my house, COVID. I applied the blood. It's impossible. It's impossible. See, and if your mind, when I even say that, just tweaks a little. If you're, when I, when, as the pastor who's anointed, and I say, it's impossible for COVID to get you. If you even think, well, that ain't, there's something wrong. Because the scripture says all things are possible to him that believes. Now that's a given if you're doing things right. And all you got to do right is believe. That's it. God didn't ask you to do anything more but believe. Believe and you'll see the glory. You got to feed your faith just like you feed your body. Right? So it's not like that's a requirement. I mean, does anybody require you to eat after eat today? Is anybody giving you a commandment to eat? You're going to eat. Why? In order to be sustained, you've got to feed your body, don't you? It's the same thing with faith. Nobody's commanded you to read the Bible. The Lord doesn't command you. But you, have, you, you endeavor and have to eat if you want your faith to be nourished. If you want to thrive. Amen? Let's look at Peter now real quick, and then we'll close. Actually, I'm going to read this, this translation. I actually sent this to somebody recently. Let me get it. First Peter 5. This actually straightened me out. First Peter 5. The Lord always has something to help you. He says, we're not even going to read verse 6. He says, verse 7, casting all your cares, anxieties, and worries, your concerns once and for all on him, for he cares about you. Effectually, so God cares about you, right? But what does he tell you to do? There's something in there. There's a requirement. He cares about you watchfully, cares about you affectionately, but guess what he says? I can care for you all day long and love you, but if you choose to continue to carry the burden, the worries, the fears, there's nothing I can do. Someone says, yeah, but the Lord's going to do. The Lord will not do anything without your cooperation, friend. Call faith. He said, you cast your cares. You download them. You get rid of them. Once you cast, throw them my way. Go ahead, throw it to me. But a lot of people just keep carrying it. And the Lord help me. He's like, man, let that go, brother. Drop it, drop it. And they keep wanting that, carry it. So what he says here, he says, cast them all. Be well balanced and temperate. And sober mind, vigilant and cautious at all times. Notice, all times. For the enemy of yours, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion in fierce hunger. He's always looking to devour somebody. Don't be deceived. He is always looking. As soon as you wake up, the devil's looking to devour you. I'm not talking about become devil conscience. Just have a general consciousness that the devil is looking to destroy you in any way he can. Through some fear, through some doubt and unbelief, through some other person going. He's always looking. He's looking to bait you. Look at the Apostle Paul. And, the, and he said, my grace is sufficient. The devil's always looking to destroy. Isn't he? He's looking to devour your faith. He goes. So the enemy of yours roams around a fierce hunger. Withstand him. Stop allowing this intruder. You understand? He says, withstand him. Be firm. His onset. Rooted, established, strong, immovable, determined. Knowing the same idea. This is the part I said to straighten me up. So many times you get locked into your challenge. But here's what the Lord says to you. Man, get over yourself. There's other people in the world going through worse things than you. There is. That's why I say you don't have any problems. You and I, the devil wants to bring you into a self-centered mentality. So you think everything going on in your life is the biggest issue in the world. Well, of course, it's the biggest issue for you, but it's not the biggest issue in the world. And if you want to just shake that thing off, just obey the Lord right here. 
resist him, stand against him, knowing the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brethren throughout the world. After you suffered for a while, the God of all peace who imparts blessing and favor. He's called you to himself will complete. He'll strengthen you, complete you, establish you. And I like this one. It says he'll establish and ground you, strengthen and settle you. Basically make you what you should be. Now I'm going to read this in closing right here. This translation, I like it. Keep a cool head. Keep, that's kind of challenging, isn't it? When things are going on. Keep a cool head. Stay alert. The devil's poised to pounce and would like nothing. This is what I like. He'd like nothing better than to catch you napping. You know what I mean? A lot of sleepy Christians. I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about sleeping spiritually. They're just like, they're waiting. Like they waited for the government to tell them, you can open your church now. You can go back and celebrate your God. Go ahead. It's Easter. Go back now. Go back like good little children and have church. But the next time something else rolls around, we'll shut you down again and, and, and tell you what you can do. Hmm? Just saying. You're not of this world, man. I don't check with the government if I can serve my God. Amen. I'm not checking with government. Government doesn't tell me, hey, bro, you can have church now and, you know, don't praise the Lord. Okay, Gavin. I won't praise the Lord while you go up to the French laundry mat and eat. Right? Because that's what he said. No, you can have church, just don't praise. Where'd that come from? So think about it. Where'd that come from? The enemy. Because if you don't praise the Lord, he won't manifest. No, I'm serious. He won't manifest. Can't you see that? The minute that person says, "Don't you, you can get together, just don't open your mouth. Oh, man. Well, then how will your mountain move? Come on now, talk to me. How will your mountain move if you can't open your mouth? Come on now. How will God manifest? Because it says he inhabits the praises of his people. So if your mouth is taped shut and, get, and there's a gag order on you, how is God going to manifest? Through your mind? Mm. All right. So I'm not saying that he knows what he's saying, but the devil knows what he's saying. You get my point? The devil knows. Don't you praise. <laughs> you know, don't you open your mouth. Don't you say hallelujah. Because <laughs> when you say hallelujah, you know what comes out of you? Light. Light. That's what hallelujah means. Light exploding in the face of darkness. When you say light, when you say hallelujah, light goes. <laughs> Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into hard times. It's it's the same with Christians all around the world. Keep a firm grip. Suffering won't last forever. Amen. Suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal glorious plans, will have you put together on your feet. He gets the last word. How many of you know the Lord's working right now in the earth? All the stuff going on, look at, look at, all the things going on in the world today. How many of you are just sitting back laughing? I am. I'm sitting back just laughing going, look, all this border stuff, you know, uh, you, there's so much stuff going on. You got border things. You got this. You got nations. You got just a whole puzzle going on and the Lord sitting back going. And some of it is the Lord is facilitating and directing people to speak. But at the same time, some of it's the Lord's waiting on the body. Don't think that God moves outside of his body. He's waiting for Christians to arise and shine and start speaking the truth. Start heralding the power of God. Amen. If someone won't receive it, just move on. You don't have to like condemn them or beat them down. They're just hell bound. It's unfortunate. People go to hell. Accept that. Understand that. Don't dismiss that. Because then you dismiss what Jesus said. People do go to hell. But do your utmost to see that everyone across your path does not go to hell. Do your best. Love them. Tell them the truth. Don't compromise it. Don't, don't try to accommodate for their emotions and their sinfulness and their failures. Don't do that. 
Tell the truth in love. and People will value you. The value the truth, which is Jesus died for your sin and my sin. Tell him your testimony, how powerful and good he is. Lay hands on him. Set him free. Preach the word and be in season, instant and out. Amen. Give God opportunity. Tell him. Just like I told these guys at work this week. I just messed up, bro, I'm COVID free, man. I don't even know them. They might tell me, go home, I'm COVID free, bro. COVID free. You know? Even when I walk in for the test, I tell them, I go, Psh. I say it with an aggression. I'm sorry, but I have to. And if someone don't like it, just that's it's their problem. I say, I'm COVID free, but I don't know about the rest of y'all. I turn it on them. I don't know about everybody else in this hospital, but I'm COVID free because they try to make it seem like you're the one bringing something in. I ain't bringing nothing in. What I bring in here is healing and restoration and power. So the one that needs to be concerned is not you, but me, because I know you ain't COVID free. <laughs> I know I'm COVID free. Amen. I know I'm COVID free. I go to the communion table. Come on now. I know I'm COVID free. That God is true and every man is a liar. That by his stripes I'm healed. I'm not sitting around thinking, oh, gee, you just said you're COVID free in church. But what if you go out and this week one day you touch something and you get COVID? No, then I'd have to say, Jesus, I sat up there and told these people I was COVID free. I did what you told me to do. Now, why is this thing coming to my life? And then the Lord say, well, yeah, but you really see. Then, I, then I'd have to say, OK, you're right, Lord, I repent. But. I can say I'm COVID free because I believe what Jesus did on the cross. I am redeemed from the curse. And the bolder you get with it, the devil hates it. The devil hates it because he's he wants you to be a nice little peep, quiet Christian. Right. While the world's all loud with their drama and their garbage, he wants you to just be a little quiet Christian. Mr. Little Quiet. And if you get like Paul the Apostle, you get loud or you act like Jesus. They hated Jesus because Jesus upended their theology, made all their stuff destabilized. Come on. Shook them up, challenged their hearts. He loved people, but he challenged them. They didn't like that. What do you mean God's your God? You can't say he's your father. Why not? Amen. Don't let the devil pounce. Resist him steadfast. In the faith. Amen. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.